Content presented on the following podcast is for information purposes only. Views and opinions expressed during this podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent views of the Whole Care Network. Always consult your physician for medical and fitness advice and always consult your attorney for legal advice. And thank you for listening to the Whole Care Network. Daughterhood, the podcast. I am your host, Roseanne Corcoran, Daughterhood Circle Leader and Primary Caregiver. Daughterhood is the creation of Ann Tumlinson, who has worked on the front lines in the healthcare field for many years and has seen the multitude of challenges caregivers face. Our mission is to support and build confidence in women who are managing their parents' care. Daughterhood is what happens when we put our lives on hold to take care of our parents. We recognize this care is too much for one person to handle alone. We want to help you see your efforts are not only good enough, they are actually heroic. Our podcast goal is to bring you some insight into navigating the healthcare system, provide resources for you as a caregiver, as well as for you as a person, and help you know that you don't have to endure this on your own. Join me in daughterhood. Cynthia Hayes is a former freelance journalist, management consultant, marketing executive, executive trainer, and cancer survivor. Cynthia used her 30 years of experience in interviewing, synthesizing information, and telling a story to write The Big Ordeal, Understanding and Managing the Psychological Turmoil of Cancer. Her research for the book included interviews with patients, caregivers, oncologists, psychologists, neuroscientists, and recovery experts of all kinds. Cynthia and I speak about the emotional response to cancer, the need for open dialogue between caregivers and their care partners, the importance of support, and the many facets of cancer caregiving. I hope you enjoy our conversation. Caregivers, no matter the illness or condition, are tasked with many of the same issues. The search for information, the stress, trying to manage your own needs and feelings, really trying to balance it all. But with a cancer diagnosis, there is an urgency and a level of panic and fear that accompany it from the actual diagnosis to waiting for results to everything in between. What are some strategies that caregivers can use to get through those times? You know, I think the experience is, um, is so challenging, both as a patient and as a, as a caregiver, because the stress changes the hormones in the, in the brain and makes it so hard to think. It makes it hard to prioritize and compartmentalize. But that's in many ways, the most important thing. Um, and of course, you know, we're overwhelmed by the enormity of the diagnosis and all that needs to be figured out and all that needs to be done and all that needs to be set in motion in order for treatment and recovery to happen. But by compartmentalizing and, and prioritizing and biting off just one little thing at a time, we can get through that enormity. And you know, what, what's important to remember is to, in fact, take that deep breath um, that allows you to sort of signal to the brain, it's okay. I'm not dying this instant. There is no lion chasing me across the prairie. I can take a deep breath. And that helps to lower the stress hormones enough so that you can, in fact, make that master list, begin to prioritize and say, okay, these are the three things we have to deal with in the next hour. Let's focus on number one first. Mm -hmm. That's hard, but that comes easier with practice. And of course, you know, the first day you hear of a diagnosis, you are at the most overwhelmed. But there are other times during the patient and caregiver experience when that sense of being overwhelmed and that sense of, oh my God, we have so many decisions to make and so much pressure we have to deal with, that keeps coming back. And so the sooner you can remember deep breaths, Lift it all out, prioritize, and focus. The you know the better things you're going to get in the long run. I mean, it's very helpful because you're already 15 steps down the down the lane, but you still have to do this first step. Okay. So being able to compartmentalize that and then okay, let's go from here. But it's hard to do that to stay in this present moment when you have to plan. It is, and and you know when I was diagnosed, I got the diagnosis 
three days before a trip I had planned with my kids meeting our favorite cousins out on the West Coast. And what was nagging me in the back of the mind is, yeah, but can surgery wait until I get back? And I just, I couldn't wait to get that question. I, I think I stopped listening, which of course is another part of the stress response. You know, when we are overwhelmed, we tend to have tunnel vision and not take in a lot of extra information. So the moment you hear that diagnosis, whatever the, the scary diagnosis is, your brain just sort of shuts down and you stop hearing the rest of the information. And of course, I was so focused on, yeah, but can I go to Napa Valley and drink some wine? <laughs> I didn't hear the rest of what the doctor had to say. He said, yes. <laughs> Yes. Thank goodness. Well, and you do. You have your own cancer diagnosis. I mean, you can certainly share your diagnosis, your story. And then why did you want to write this book? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, my diagnosis was endometrial cancer. Uh, they discovered it on a pap smear. I had zero symptoms. I was behind schedule for a gynecologic exam. My doctor was chasing me and I'm like, nonchalant about it because the media says, oh, every two years is fine. Um, right. And the doctor called me and said, no, 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 you get your butt in here now. It's been over a year, time for a checkup. And thank goodness she chased me because yeah. the week after the uh, the visit, um, she called to say there are some, you know, blah, blah, blah cells in your pap smear and I don't like it and you need to come right back in for a biopsy. And I just sort of shrugged and said, eh, you know, no big deal, no big deal until I Googled what those blah blah cells were, and then it was instant panic that I was going to die of a highly aggressive um, form of cancer that had, you know, 40% survival rate. So thankfully, you know, biopsy confirmed it, but then I had uh, surgery and uh, six rounds of chemo, and I was on the, the lucky end of that, um, uh, that set of numbers. Um, But it was while I was going through chemo and was weak and bald and pathetic and weepy and just overwhelmed by everything that was happening. And I was at the gym trying desperately to make the wheels of a uh, of an exercise bike go around when this total stranger sat down on the bike beside me and started telling me his cancer story. Now, Obviously, I was a cancer patient. There was no question in anybody's mind about that. Um, but what was surprising was how much of the experience we shared uh, from an emotional perspective, even though physically our situations were entirely different. He had melanoma. His was a quote unquote incurable disease. Mine had slightly better odds than that. His was 15 years earlier. Uh, you know, I was going through it, but he talked about his sense of isolation, his uh, tremendous fear, um, his difficulty in communicating with his spouse about what was going on with him psychologically, his overwhelming depression, his fear and anxiety. And I was like, oh, you had that? I had that. Oh, look at that. You had that? I had that. I was like, well, if this happens, if this is common, why does nobody talk about it? And that got me wanting to know, well, just how common is it? And, you know, why does it happen if it is so common? What's what's behind the emotional turmoil? And then, you know, what does that mean for those of us um, going through it, either as as patients or caregivers? And of course, you know, like uh, Fred Astaire and Ginger Rogers, caregivers go through everything in high heels and backwards because they are not the center of attention, but they have to keep everything else going um, while dealing with um, the emotional and physical support of the patient. And meanwhile, trying to somehow deal with their own um, emotional and physical needs. All of a sudden, as a caregiver, you have, you know, twice the burden because you used to share household responsibilities. Now they're all on you. You used to share financial responsibilities. Now they're all on you. You are as afraid for the patient as the patient is for him or herself. And that compounds into a really dramatic emotional uh, ordeal for, for all of us. I felt it was time we started talking about some of this stuff. So that's why I wrote the book. <laughs> totally agree with you. And it is, it is, it's not just one person. One person receives the diagnosis, but there's two people or maybe more. If you're, if God willing, if you're lucky that you have that type of support network, you're all experiencing that from your own point of view. And it's a, that's right. it's a, it's a dance. It is a dance. It, it is a dance. And of course, you know, even if the emotions are somewhat predictable uh, in terms of, you know, 
what they will be. The mm -hmm. intensity and the way we express them uh, vary enormously. I, you know, we're we're different people with different lived experiences and different DNA and different, you know, hormonal brain pathways and, and all sorts of stuff. That just means that, you know, my anxiety may look different than your anxiety. My um, depression may look different than your depression. And so even in familial situations where people have lived together for a long time and think they know each other, it can be really surprising that, you know, oh, I didn't know you were depressed. Well, maybe you didn't know it because I didn't want you to know it. Maybe you didn't know it because you were afraid to acknowledge it. Um, and maybe there's a lot of both of that happening at the same time. So it, it, it gets complicated. It gets complicated. Well, absolutely. And you, you write about um, the protection that each person wants to provide. The, the patient wants to protect their caregiver. The caregiver wants to protect their how, how do you How do you balance that? How, does, how do you flesh that out? Yeah, it's really tricky. You know, I think that um, sometimes people are unwilling to express their emotions or unable to express their emotions because they are not ready to deal with that emotion themselves. And if you state it, then first of all, it makes it real. Um, yep. But second of all, then you have to be willing uh, and able to deal with it in conversation because now it's going to come back at you. And um, And sometimes you don't want to communicate that emotion because you know that your family member, your loved one, your care partner is not going to be able to deal with that emotion. And so, yes, you are being protective. But if I am protective of you by not sharing um, my full emotions with you, and then you are being protective of me by not sharing your full emotions with me, we have this knowledge gap in here yeah. that over time becomes a huge gap in the relationship and we either pussyfoot around or we uh, you know stomp all over uh, each other's emotions because we don't know what we're what we're really dealing with mm -hmm. and it's it's hard because you know again sometimes you're just not ready to deal with it and sometimes you don't have the kind of trusting relationship even with those that you deeply love where you can feel comfortable sharing your deepest emotions. And so it, it really does become a, uh, a difficult cycle for a lot of, a lot of families where, you know, like I might feel okay telling this to one family member and telling something different to another family member based on my relationships with those two different people and based on how I know they're going to uh, respond back to me. But then they might have a conversation. It's like, no, you're wrong. No, you're wrong because I haven't, I haven't told them the same thing. So it gets complicated. Well, and it's hard too because, you know, when do you have those conversations? Sometimes it's like, I, I need a minute. I need a minute. I have to, I have to get here myself. And then there's denial where I, I don't want to talk about it. It doesn't exist. I'm not going down that road. As a caregiver, you have to know how to navigate both of those terrains with your care partner. What's the best way to try to do that, both with denial and with the I need a minute? Yeah, I, you know, I think it's, it's a really um, tricky question. And I think ultimately the answer is what's going to feel best for the patient within the bounds of what you as a care partner can tolerate. And, and that's tricky because, you know, sometimes we need to talk and sometimes the patient doesn't want to talk about it. Um, you know, I know my, my husband and I have very different tolerances for talking about body parts, pain, discomfort, medical issues, whatever. And I can get in his face in a way that is really irritating to him because he just doesn't want to talk about it. Um, and to me, it's like, well, if you don't talk about it, then how, how are we dealing with it? You know, right. but I've learned, nope, it's his body. I just got to shut up. And sometimes that's what you have to do until it gets to the point where it's interfering with your ability to take care of, uh, of him or her. So, uh, you know, that's yet another stress that is uh, yeah. borne by the caregiver um, at a time when, again, the patient is the, is the, um, the star of the show. Right. Um, we're just a supporting cast. Um, but we have to support in a way that's, uh, that's appropriate. And it's, it's all that balance. And you're trying to find yeah. that balance. Yes, exactly. And and what works today may not be what works tomorrow. Um, right. What is appropriate today may not be appropriate tomorrow. Right. 
you know, I always presented sort of a, a badass attitude. Uh, my, it, my oncologist used to refer to me as one badass patient. And that fit with who I was, that I could handle anything. Um, and my family, that I could handle anything. And my husband walked me to my first chemo and then said, oh, this is scary. I don't want to look at those needles. I'll, I'll faint. I'm out of here. <laughs> so I had, to, I had to maintain that, that badassness. But I didn't always feel badass. And so, you know, where could I let down? Where could I um, express that, uh, that true emotion? I had to sort that out because if I overwhelmed him, I wasn't going to get any support. Right. But if I didn't express my emotions, I also wasn't going to get any support. So finding the right way as a patient can be hard. And then finding the right balance as a, uh, as a caregiver can be hard. So. Tricky, tricky navigation. It's a maze with what you feel is a time pressure because it's like you have to get this, you have to get that, I have to find a doctor. Who and that's the other stress is in that decision making because you're making these decisions together. And you know, when you try to find a doctor, you you know, you ask around, you check their reviews online if you can find that. It's it's painstaking. With a cancer yeah. diagnosis, it's basically, hey, you have cancer and you need to see somebody like tomorrow. And that alone. You know, you may not agree with who you're seeing or you may have, well, what if we do here? Well, what if we go there? And again, it's just more stress. It is. It, it's a very challenging time. And I think that, you know, what what I learned and, and in the course of writing the book, I interviewed over 100, you know, cancer patients, a whole mess of uh, experts of all types, a bunch of caregivers, oncologists, psychologists, exercise physiologists, uh, you know, even neuroscientists. I mean, it was a fascinating process. And what I uncovered was that, you know, the, the first reaction is fear and anxiety. And those are really, really um, high for most patients and caregivers right at the beginning. Sure. But when it comes time to make a decision, it's like somehow we manage to actually make that list and clarify and prioritize and get through that process. And the stress is very high. But then once we make a decision, it's like the stress comes way down because it's like, okay, it's decided. We're moving forward. Um, we're, we're, we're getting through this. And it, it's like there needs to be a, a switch in the brain that goes from that anxiety and sense of being overwhelmed that clarity that comes with having made a decision. And of course, some people just, you know, whatever their doctor tells them, that's what they do. And other people are much more like, no, I have to gather all of the information and all of the recommendations. So not everybody struggles as much as as you or I might have, but it's, it's clearly a very stressful time because you do feel like you have to hurry. This is cancer. This is bad news. But also that you have to get it right um, and that there is only one right answer. And of course, that's not the truth. There are lots of different ways to get there. And we make the best decision that we can with the information that we have on hand. And then we move forward. But we often feel like there is only one right answer. And how do we know that we have found that one right answer? And of course, the one right answer for me may be a very different answer than for my care partner or another patient in the same circumstances. And so, you know, it it becomes a a question of how do you weigh information with your comfort and your trust in your medical provider? Because ultimately, you're putting your body in the hands of somebody that uh, that you trust. And, uh, you know, what makes you feel good about uh, that relationship? Is it that this person had the most information or is it that this person had the warmest smile and the greatest confidence that he or she was going to take care of you? And, you know, we all approach these decisions differently. I am definitely an information gatherer and got, you know, multiple opinions. But ultimately, I think I made my decision based on a gut reaction to the doctor that I ended up trusting my life. It's unclear that there's a you know, uh, one prescribed method there. I think we're all, again, very different in how we're going to make those decisions and, and whatnot. But we definitely have a much lower level of stress once we've made that decision. Um, okay. As scary as the next steps may be, there's a sense that, well, somebody is going to take care of it now. I've made the hard decisions now. I just need to listen and follow instructions and do what's expected of me. Oh, that's, that's wonderful. And you even have a graph in the book 
that's entitled The Emotional Turmoil of Cancer, and it ranges, and it ranges from shock and disbelief to accepting the new normal. Can you tell me how you figured all of that out? And I'm sure from your experience, but... sure. You know, and, um, and I'm not the only one to have tried to uh, to document this. And so there's uh, sure. you know, terrific work that's gone on long before me and uh, that served as, as sort of the foundation for my work. But, um, but you know, after interviewing hundreds of patients and, and their loving caregivers, the patterns were just clear. Mm-hmm. And the uh, fear and anxiety uh, that really stay with us throughout the entire process are, are um you know, they, they ebb and flow the most. And some of the other emotions emerge at specific times during the, the treatment process or recovery process or whatever. But that, that fear and anxiety were almost um, universal. And, you know, as I said, uh, come and go a bit, but they, they're pretty uh, pervasive in cancer. Being aware of that is so important. And it's so helpful as I would think it would be helpful as a caregiver to know that. Well, I think that's right. And I think that, you know, first of all, you know, because we don't talk about emotions, we think when we start having these emotions that there must be something wrong with us. Uh, You know, why is it that I am so weak and pathetic that I can't, you know, smile every day through cancer and and maintain a positive attitude? Well, you can't because your hormones are all messed up. Your brain chemistry is all messed up and your body is all messed up. So no, don't expect that of yourself. But the, the, the media, the the way we talk about cancer, the, you know, rah, rah, raise money effort right. and the, um, you know, the fight terminology all leads to this sense that we need to be positive. Mm-hmm. Um, but in fact, there are a lot of things working against that, that positivity. Um, I think one of the most interesting conversations I had was with that uh, neuroscientist who was explaining to me that uh, there, there's a class of proteins in the body called cytokines and cytokines allow the immune system to communicate uh, with itself. And they're pro-inflammatory cytokines and anti-inflammatory cytokines. And for the most part, they're kept pretty much in balance in our body. But if you get a paper cut, the pro-inflammatory cytokines are released and go to that site and say, oh, we need some platelets over here. Let's heal up this site. Uh, Oh, we're losing red blood cells. Let's get some more red blood cells. Oh, let's make sure there's no infection. So all of a sudden you've got pro-inflammatory cytokines. That's why you get a little redness where that, um, where that paper cut is. And after a couple of days, as that paper cut heals, the anti-inflammatory cytokines come along and say, oh, yeah, looks good. Let's get rid of all of the excess platelets, white blood cells, et cetera, et cetera. And everything goes back to normal. Well, if a paper cut throws off your uh, <laughs> cytokines, just imagine what a uh, massive surgery where it turns out the presence of cancer, um, the dying of cancer cells when treatment happens, chemotherapy in and of itself is um, an inflammatory process. Radiation is an inflammatory process. Some immunotherapies are pro-inflammatory cytokines. And so we are just awash with pro-inflammatory cytokines. And it turns out that the brain reads that excess of pro-inflammatory cytokines as a massive sickness and just sends us back to bed. And that's why all we want to do is climb into bed and pull the covers over uh, our head and pretend like, you know, the world doesn't exist because I'm just going to die right here in my, uh, in my little bed. And of course, you know, we have the ability to fight that, but we have to really work hard against it. We have to, there are things we can do to change that brain chemistry. Everything from a little bit of exercise, like, okay, get up and walk to the kitchen. A <laughs> um, little bit of exercise. I'm not talking about running marathons um, or, you know, laughter or hugs or, you know, other brain stimulating the release of other brain uh, chemicals that can help counteract that. But it's ridiculous to think that you're going to go through cancer and never want to cry. It's, you know, absurd to think that any major, you know, surgery or disease isn't going to cause an emotional response, you know, not to mention the fact that many end up, um, their cancer treatments, uh, whether it's surgery or chemotherapy, end up screwing around with their hormones. Right. If you're a woman and you have a hysterectomy, those ovaries that might not have been producing eggs might still have been producing hormones gone. You are a guy and you've got prostate cancer and, you know, they remove your prostate. Oh, there goes another hormone producer. We're going to give you more steroids. That's going to give you, you know, more hormones of a different type that are going to exacerbate your energy, but maybe your anger. You know, so there's all sorts of things going on in your body 
that drive that emotional response. But again, we don't talk about emotions and we don't talk about cancer. So we're certainly not going to own up to the fact that there are any emotions associated with cancer. And, and of course, that expectation that we stay positive throughout the cancer experience is just one more burden and one more way that we as cancer patients feel like we're not living up to expectations. Yep. So it's, that's, a really, that's a really hard thing. Um, you know, and it's hard as a, as a patient. I mean, I think one of the low points in the emotional cycle is um, when you're sort of midway through treatment and, you know, you've got a little bit of chemo fog, which, by the way, it's not really related to the chemo, it's related to those pro-inflammatory cytokines. Mm -hmm. um, so it doesn't matter whether you're having chemo or not, you're going to get it. Uh, but you've got, you know, your brain isn't functioning quite right. You know, you may have lost some of your hair due to treatment, so you're not looking like yourself. Your energy is low. You're not feeling like yourself. So you have this major identity crisis and your role in the household may have changed. You know, so you've got this emotional crisis that comes from, I don't know who I am anymore. I'm no longer the boss of my household. I can no longer do my job. I can't think. I don't look like who I'm supposed to look like. I don't feel like who I'm supposed to feel like. Who am I? And, and that in and of itself is just such a destabilizing experience for, for so many cancer patients. And of course, the household is trying to accommodate this new way of uh, being um, in the patient. And then often the patient eventually recovers and wants their old role back in the household. And that doesn't happen either. So right. the, the challenges don't end when the treatment ends. No. And I totally agree with you. Words matter. And that battle terminology that gives you the impression that, well, I guess they just weren't trying hard enough. That's why that's why the cancer is winning. Or she never complained. Well, maybe she didn't complain because she didn't feel comfortable that there was anybody willing to listen to what she wanted to say. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's very hard because you're exactly right. All of this is happening. It doesn't happen. It's not like you go and, you know, you're getting your teeth cleaned. You're having this, um, I don't want to say poison, but po the chemotherapy, yeah. it's poison. It's poison. And yeah. you can't ex you can't expect that not to affect you as a person. And yeah. I I think it's important to change that that type of terminology to help both the patient and their caregiver because then the care you know if 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 it's not working and then the caregiver people look at the caregiver like well what are they doing what are you doing you're not helping them enough you're not you know didn't you try this yeah. treatment and what about that and I think it's just. It's that it's that cycle that just beats you down. Yeah, I, I think that's right, and I think that the the language is is hard. You know, some people are really motivated by the battle language. So I I hate the battle language, but some people are really motivated by it because yeah, they, it. they feel like they need to you know that rallies them to to fight to push harder to push themselves a little bit harder. But where we really get in trouble is when we say somebody so and so lost her battle to cancer. <sighs> no, she didn't lose her battle. Mm -mm. Treatment failed her. Right. You know? right. So and so was failed by the medical, uh, you know, treatments available. Yes. But it, but it's hard because you want, as a as a patient, you want to feel like you can help the process along. But meanwhile, it's unclear that there is anything that you can do or not do that is going to make the treatment any more effective. I mean, obviously, you know. You should give up smoking. <laughs> you shouldn't smoke through uh, cancer treatment, regardless of what type of cancer it is. Right. You know, there are, there are some obvious things, but a lot of it is beyond our control, just like it is beyond our control who actually gets cancer. You know, there are people that have smoked, you know, three packs a day for, you know, 90 years and lived a perfectly fine life. Yeah. And then there are people like me who like eat healthy, exercise all the time, don't generally play with asbestos, but somehow manage to get <laughs> cancer. <laughs> so it's, it's, um, there's a lot that is just beyond our control. And, and recognizing that while it is beyond our control, we can do things to strengthen the immune system. And that may help us, mm -hmm. um, but also letting go of that sense of responsibility that comes with control. And I think that that's, that's the problem that's embedded in that battle uh, metaphor is that we are responsible for how hard we fight. And, you know, that, that that how hard we fight is going to determine whether or not we win the battle is, you know, a bad metaphor, really bad metaphor. That said, I do encourage people to get plenty of sleep, 
uh, eat well, exercise to the ability that they can um, given their cancer, and as care partners to do the same because all of those things help to reduce stress and stress depletes the immune system. And you want to do whatever you can to support a healthy immune system. And so therefore, you know, don't drink to excess, even though a you certain may diagnosis to. may <laughs> make you want to do that. <laughs> you know, yep. take a walk every day if you can. <laughs> um, that's going to help. There are days when you're undergoing treatment, you just can't, but maybe the next day you can. And so take a walk. Um, and so those, those little things can make a difference. And they not only help to strengthen the immune system, they also help to uh, improve your mood. And so the little things can make a difference, but they can't, they're not going to change whether or not the treatment is working for your cancer. You know, that was, that ship sailed a long time ago. And, um, you know, the good news is that there are so many new treatments these days um, that I know a number of cancer patients who, you know, the first treatment didn't work. They started the second treatment and they started the second treatment, they were hopeful. That one didn't work. They started a third treatment and the doctor said, well, I don't know what's going to happen after, you know, after this one, if it fails, but I'm sure that another one will come along and lo and behold, another one's come along. You know, so, you know, there, there are new developments happening all of the time. And so even when it's a late stage grim diagnosis, there's still hope that, you know, something else is going to work, even if this one doesn't. Um, and, and that's, a very different circumstance than it was even, you know, five or 10 years ago. Sure. Uh, the, they've made huge advances with immunotherapies and PARP inhibitors and cancer vaccines. I mean, all sorts of new uh, treatments that just didn't exist before mm -hmm. that are, you know, it, it takes some degree of digging to find a clinical trial that might work or a, uh, a doctor who's willing to experiment, but there's a, there's a tremendous hope um, there's at this point. Thank goodness. Well, how do you balance that hope and the reality? Oh, well, you know, I think that that's a, a challenge for all of us and something that is, is definitely an individual process. I, I think that what is helpful for most people is a, you know, one day at a time uh, sort of approach um, and to not allow ourselves to get overwhelmed by um, the what if. And it, it, it's hard not to go down the road of the, well, what if this treatment fails and what if that happens and what if I can't do this? Like, you know, you wake up and it's like, okay, I feel pretty good today. I'm going to go and enjoy my day. Or I wake up and I'm not feeling so good. And it's like, all right, I'm just going to, you know, rest up today and maybe tomorrow will be better. And really focusing on what is good today, what works today and having a goal um, of, you know, I'm going to recover. I'm going to get better. I'm going to get strong enough to do X, Y, and Z, that's great. But it's like, what do I have today? What can I look forward to tomorrow? But what do I have today? A dear friend of mine is on her fourth cancer and uh, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, I don't know if they're going to come up with yet another treatment uh, that will keep her going. But every single day she embraces it with energy and a smile. And that's not to say that, you know, she's not, crying in the shower every day or sure. cursing out her husband for some, you know, minor infraction, but she also finds a way to find the joy uh, every day. And I, and I just look at her and I think that's, that's amazing. That's, that's what I would want no matter where I am in life is to be able to find the joy in that, in that particular moment at that particular day. That's amazing. And, and it's beautiful because it's really, it's all we all have. It is. Whether we have an, an issue or not, it's all we have because we don't know. We don't know what our lives hold. We don't know what's in front of us. That's exactly right. You know, that, that proverbial bus could come barreling down the street at any moment. But, you know, exactly. <laughs> we, we have this sense that we have control over our lives and that we have agency. And, and, and I, think, I think sometimes these diagnoses and, and hurdles in life are harder for those of us who are used to being able to control our environment. Um, and, you know, I, I work as a mentor now at a couple of different uh, cancer centers, helping newly diagnosed patients get through their treatment and, you know, maintaining some degree of support thereafter. And what I have come to see is that some people don't expect to be able to control their lives, don't expect to be able to influence their environment, and actually just take 
cancer more in stride than certainly I did um, because I was so used to, you know, being the boss of my life. Um, right. And if you're not the boss of your life, then this is just one more, you know, bump, stupid thing. Yeah. One more bump in the road. Um, and, and I guess finding the resilience that comes with recognizing that, no, I'm not the boss of my life, but I can be the boss of getting over this bump. I can be the boss of finding a, a way to smile through the day. And that resilience is something that comes with practice. You know, none of us is, is really born resilient, but we are made resilient by learning that, you know, whether it's as a, as a baby, eventually the diaper will get changed and I will be more comfortable to as a child that, no, I can't always have my own way, but it's okay because sometimes I do to, you know, as, a, as an adult learning that uh, life doesn't always go the way I want it to, but I have the ability to, uh, to cope. And, uh, and, and of course, cancer or any major diagnosis is a, um, a large bump um, for most of us. So it takes a little bit more effort to find the resilience to get over that bump. But I think that uh, resilience is something that we we all can get better at, and that um, the more we work at it, the more likely we are to get better at it. It's almost like resilience is a muscle. Like, how do you build that muscle? What is your what's your favorite way of trying to develop that? Yeah, I I think it helps to have a bunch of different tools at your uh, disposal um, for for coping. And I do think that. Um, uh, you know, I like to talk about there being sort of uh, three different categories of coping mechanisms. There's coping by doing, coping by thinking, and coping by sort of mind-body, you know, combination things. The, the coping by thinking is what I come by naturally. It's the compartmentalizing. It's the problem solving. It's the research and information gathering. And it is using all of our cognitive skills to try and solve what seems like an insurmountable problem. But you can't rely on just those skills because there's a lot of times when it just seems like it is insurmountable. Yes. Um, and so that's where the coping by doing comes in. And that is the exercise and the diet and the sleep. But it's also the laughter. It's the hugs. It's the playing with the dog. It's the, all of these things that have been proven time and again to cause a release of positive chemicals in our brains. So uh, exercise releases endorphins that makes us feel good. A hug uh, gives us oxytocin, although it has to be at least a seven second hug in order to actually stimulate that release of oxytocin. Oxytocin is the um, the hormone that is stimulated when a mother is nursing and bonding with her baby. It's, it's a feel good and connected uh, sort of a hormone. Mm-hmm. We can fool our brain into being better and therefore actually convince the brain that it is better by stimulating the release of these, um, these positive chemicals in our brain. And we'll do that by sitting in the sunshine for 20 minutes. We'll get a sunburn, but go and soak up a little bit of sunshine. Walking in the woods. Um, it turns out that walking on a city street is good. Walking in the woods is even better because of all of the, uh, the chemicals one inhales from trees, apparently, is very good for us. In, uh, in Japan, they uh, refer to it as forest bathing, where you actually take a walk in the woods for 30 minutes and just you know, soak up all of those chemicals. What's that? So all of those things, that's the coping by doing. Right. And then the third category is mind-body coping. And that's everything from, you know, yoga and Tai Chi to massage and meditation and prayer. And turns out that uh, knitting falls into this category because mm-hmm. you're reciting the knit one, pro one, knit one, pro one, and your hands are busy. And lo and behold, your brain has to relax right. because you can't, also be focused on your worries because you're so focused on what your hands and your, so all of these things that involve your body doing one thing and your mind doing something different at the same time uh, are actually really, really good for you. That's really Um, great. So by having all of those skills at our uh, disposal and sort of sequencing when we apply them and how we apply them allows us to, to be more resilient. And the more we practice those things, the more we build that, that resiliency. That's great. And, you know, and what works one day won't necessarily work the next. And so that's why you need to have, you know, a quiver full of arrows to start flinging at it. So. Yeah. It's collaborative. It can be collaborative. So your care, your, the caregiver and their care partner, they can do it together or, they could do it in their own 
you know, support, because that's, that's the other question, the importance of support throughout this process for both the person living with their cancer and their caregiver. They both need support because even at the end of the day, they're still dealing with things separately. They are. They are. And that's the important thing to, to keep in mind. And, you know, if I'm the, the patient and you're the caregiver and I need to talk about it um, and you need to go take a walk in the woods, we're at a bit of an impasse because, <laughs> you know, I want, I want you here to listen. And which is why it takes a, it takes a village. Um, yes. You know, one of the things that I learned about, you know, long after my diagnosis was that, you know, there are tremendous resources available out there um, for patients and for caregivers. But again, we have to know to ask for Correct. it. And so that means that we have to know that it's okay to feel this way, that we need them. <laughs> and therefore, mm -hmm. uh, no, I, that's one of the things that just frustrates me no end about our um, healthcare system. You know, if you, if you break your leg, and you're in pain, you know, ask the doctor for some careful, appropriate uh, pain meds. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're going through cancer and you are an emotional wreck, we don't know that it's okay to ask your doctor, is there any support available? And of course, there's so many types of support, everything from, you know, antidepressants and, and uh, you know, things to help with mood to exercise classes to, uh, I don't know, support there's- groups. Um, <laughs> All support sorts of support, support groups, groups and yeah. and there are support groups for people who are newly diagnosed, people who yep. are dealing with a long-term diagnosis, support groups for patients, support groups for caregivers, mm -hmm. and there's one-on-one -on -one support. You know, so many people say they are hesitant to join a support group because they don't want to be weighed down by somebody else's angst when they're trying to deal with their own. Um, there are so many great one-on-one uh, -on -one mentorship programs, Immerman Angels, Cancer Support Network, uh, Sure Sarah. I mean, all of these organizations, they offer one-on-one -on -one peer mentoring. And so you can be matched with somebody who has your exact same cancer and, you know, has gotten to the other side mm -hmm. and you can not hear their story if you don't want to, but you can hear what they learned from their story and you can hear how they got to the other side. So, you know, you can, you can tailor your support needs with a peer mentor in a way that you can't with a support group. And then there are, of course, tremendous resources online for learning about what you can expect, be it emotionally or, or physically from the ordeal. So, mm -hmm. But again, you have to know to ask. And that's the, that's the hard thing, I think, right now is like nobody tells you that it's okay to need these things. And so therefore... You don't assume that there are these things out there. Right. Again, with anything, the caregiver is the last part of the equation when you're dealing with the medical establishment. They just are. They can't bill for you. There's no code for you. That's exactly right. And it's hard because we are the backbone. We are the backbone of this system. Yeah. And yet we're a complete and utter afterthought. Yeah. And so is the emotional support of getting through anything. Right. And, and it's... It's mind numbing that this actually happens. The flip side with with support is that you don't realize, as you said earlier, oh, you feel that way? So do I. This isn't strange. I'm not losing my mind because I feel this way. You feel this way. And right. it gives you that. I'm community. not being a selfish, horrible person to feel the way I feel as a caregiver, resenting the fact that my life now revolves around a patient. Yes. <laughs> yeah. In the yes. Yes, absolutely. Oh my goodness, really? Okay, well, shoot. Oh, okay. There's my exhale. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. Exactly. And yeah. and I think that's really that grief that runs through. Grief runs through from the moment you receive any diagnosis, but especially with a cancer diagnosis, it just runs. Your life has changed, their life has changed, everything that you had planned for has changed, even if everything works out it's still changed. It's still different. And, you know, the anticipatory grief, and as much as we don't talk about emotions, we really don't talk about grief. Nobody wants to talk about grief. You are so right. Uh, you know, cancer in particular is all about loss. And it's not, you know, we're not just talking about the loss of your hair, but every expectation that you had for your life has been challenged by this diagnosis. And um, however long it takes to get through, you know, treatment, whatever that might be, that's a period of your life that you're never going to get back. But at the end of that, 
you're looking at a life that's taken a very different trajectory from what you were anticipating, you know, the week before your diagnosis. And so that's changed for you. But yes, as you said, it changes for everybody else in the household as well. So it, it's, I, I like to say the cancer is all about loss and grief. And it's, it's interesting how we all process it. And, you know, for many people, the way they make sense of it is to do something, you know, uh, positive in the extreme. So, you know, one uh, woman I met in this process uh, started a, an international um, cancer organization that's raising awareness and bringing support in developing countries. Uh, you know, as bad as it is here in the States, imagine what it's like elsewhere. <laughs> You know, another another woman that I met in this process has started an organization to bring cancer patients as volunteers to random parts of the world, doing things that can help them remember that they actually have it pretty good, even if they don't have it as good as they used to have it. Yeah, so people people go and do extraordinary things in the process of trying to make sense of it. But ultimately, what we have to do is get to a point where we accept that there's a very different set of expectations for our uh, lives now than what there were, you know, prior to that diagnosis. And so, yeah, that's a, it's a huge loss. Yeah. And even if it looks like we step back into our lives, you know, the way they were, it's it's different. Uh, it's different, you know, physically and emotionally. It's just different. The big part and the underlying issue is it's okay to ask for that help. It's okay in, there's no shame in saying, I need help to get through this and to then access that help. It's, it, you know, there, there just isn't, there just isn't any shame in that. And I think that that's a very important piece that people miss sometimes. I, I think that's absolutely right. And we all do need help along the way. It's not, it's not just that it's, you know, there's no shame, but there should actually be an expectation <laughs> that, we, right. that we need that help. There should be an expectation that we're going to ask at some point for, uh, for support yeah. because we all need it. And, and that was really, you know, as I said, what, what motivated um, uh, writing the book and, and the blog and getting involved in, in mentoring. It's all about helping people understand that this is a normal, healthy process. This happens. Right. And so Let's just be upfront about it. Let's acknowledge that it's happening and let's make sure that you get the support you need in order to get through yeah, it. Totally agree. I think that um, just, you know, validating the experience of patients by letting them know that they're not alone in this experience is just is so important. I agree. Totally agree. I, I would ask you what you would have to say to someone who just received a diagnosis and their caregiver, but I feel like you just said it. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't know. We can, I can certainly. <laughs> you know, one of the interesting things that I've learned over, over the past, uh, you know, five years, six years, six years that I've been focusing on the seven years since my diagnosis is that sometimes the most important thing you can do is not say anything at all, but just listen. And I, I think so often because we are uncomfortable having emotional conversations, because we're uncomfortable with the topic of cancer we all sort of race in to try and solve a problem that hasn't yet been expressed. And so I think one of the most important things to say to somebody who is newly diagnosed is I'm, I'm here for you. Um, tell me about it. What are you thinking and feeling? And allowing them to express their emotions, their uh, needs, their fears, their desires, and then asking, how can I help? What can I do for you? And of course, you know, there's a real trade-off. Some people say, oh, don't ask a patient what to do. Just right. jump in and do um, because you can see. But sometimes you can't see. And sometimes jumping in and doing takes the agency away from somebody who has already lost so much. And so I encourage people to really listen and then suggest, would it be helpful if I did X, Y, and Z for you? And ask because that person still wants control over their lives. You know, when my, when my mom was, um, my mom passed away a little over a year ago and she I'm was um, in hospice. She was 95 years old. And God bless her. Um, yeah, she had lived a good long life, but I, I, we had hospice at home and she had a caregiver there who was, you know, with her 24 seven and she was sort of in and out of consciousness and she had had a, a Parkinson's like syndrome that made it difficult for her to communicate. And so she really wasn't speaking. 
And she had her hands folded over her chest and I could see that her nails needed trimming. So, you know, I got up and I got the nail scissors and I came back and I was going to set to work. And she just glared at me and pulled her hands away from me. She didn't want it. What I didn't understand was that she was praying. And, you know, 15 minutes later, she was done and she was very happy to give me her hands. (laughs) But I made the decision myself that this is what should be done as opposed to asking her, is it okay if I cut your nails now? And, you know, that just brought it so home for me because I felt so bad after that for interrupting her prayers. But of course, you know, it's something that we all want to do. We all want to feel like we're being helpful. We all want to chip in and do something that it's going to make us feel better to do something. Um, And so we blindly go and do. But what's better is to think through, well, okay, our children play together. You probably could do with a few hours of sanity. What would you think if I took your daughter on mine to the playground next week? That'd uh, be helpful to you. Ask. And maybe, you know, maybe you'll both be rewarded by, uh, you know, everyone feeling good about, uh, about that. But maybe, you know, the daughter is a solace to the patient and the patient doesn't want the daughter to disappear for three hours. Right. So listen, 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 listen. I love that. No matter how well we think we know the patient. We don't understand exactly what's going on unless they've told us. So yep. we just need to listen. I love that. That's fantastic. We covered a lot of ground today. Are there any final thoughts you'd like to share? I do just encourage everyone to you know remember that because we are all so different, we can't assume that my anxiety is the same as your anxiety, that my fear is the same as your fear, and that my way of dealing with my anxiety and fear are going to be the same as your way of dealing with your anxiety and fear. And so no matter how well we think we know a patient or a caregiver, um, no matter how close the relationship is between those people, we have to assume that there are things that are unspoken and, uh, and therefore ask. You may not get the answer you want to hear, but it's always good to ask. A big thank you to Cynthia Hayes for being my guest today. To learn more about Cynthia, her resources, her blog, cancer stories, and her book, check out her website, TheBigOrdeal.com. I hope you enjoyed our podcast today. Head over to daughterhood.org and click on the podcast section for show notes, including the full transcript and links to any resources and information from today's episode. You can find and review us on Apple Podcasts or anywhere you listen to your podcasts. We are also on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Daughterhood the Podcast and on my blog, HeyRow.com. Feel free to leave me a message and let me know what issues you may be facing and would like to hear more about. Or even if you just want to say hi, I'd love to hear from you. Also, a very special thank you to Susan Rowe for our theme music, the instrumental version of her beautiful song, Mama's Eyes, from her album, Lessons in Love. I hope you found what you were looking for today. Information, inspiration, or even just a little company. This is Roseanne Corcoran. I hope you'll join me next time in Daughterhood.